This is First Contact, Stories of the Call Center. Brought to you by Noball Biz, your one-stop shop for all your contact center needs, both carrier and software. Each show, we talk to industry leaders on how they got their start in the call center industry, because let's be honest, it's not a dream job. My guest today is Jim Rembach, a longtime industry veteran and former frontline leader in contact centers, creator of Call Center Coach Virtual Leadership Academy, the Contact Center Virtual Summit, host of the Fast Leader Podcast, and chief editor of the Contact Center Media Hub, cxglobalmedia.com. Jim has lived the road to success down the rocky Contact Center path. After leaving the industry for a few months, midway through his career, he finally realized throughout his career, he's battled every competent senior leaders, incompetent colleagues, toxic cultures, lousy behavior, including his own, getting fired, and finally rising from the ashes of despair. Jim will even help you avoid repeating those mistakes he made so you can move onward and upward faster. Jim, that's quite a career. We're lucky to have you here. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity, so thank you very much. Looking forward to having a great discussion. And I mean, I really have to start with one thing, right? What's up with ashes from despair? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, for me, um, uh, so for those of you who have gone through the Myers-Briggs type testing, I'm an INTJ. and for us that are INTJs, um, you know, we have, you know, issues with, uh, you know, emotions, you know, I mean, I am a colorful, passionate person, but being somewhat of an introvert, sometimes I don't do a good job of being able to convey that or communicate with that. And, and I'm my own worst enemy. I mean, for me, I'm a person who is achievement based. I, I'm not competitive. I mean, so what that means is that doesn't matter if I win, I still beat myself up because I could have done something better. Um, mm. And so really trying to focus in on being appreciative more is important. So when you start talking about ashes of despair, like, you know, going through and dealing with a certain, you know, boss or colleague or losing your job um, or just not performing in the, in the way that you want to in your job, that's just, that's despair. I mean, you, you could fall into, you know, the blues, uh, maybe even depression. I mean, and those things are, something that yeah. you have to learn how to manage. And I think, especially when you start talking about a contact center environment being fast paced, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's very easy for that to happen. You know, some of it's very repetitive and can be boring and doesn't challenge you, but then, you know, you, you have this, this flip side. So it's, it, it was the ashes of despair and rising from them is really been a lifelong battle for me. And for, you know, many that are just starting in this and I, I have a conversation uh, with someone on a regular basis as a coach, you know, who's dealing with this stuff. Um, it's not easy. And so you have to really focus in on how do I rise above? That definitely makes sense. And I think we always say, you know, we can be our worst enemy, right? We, we go in there, we're our harshest critic. We're the ones that hold ourselves to the highest standard when we're in that mindset. And obviously being able to get out of that or to utilize that in a way to become a strength so that you don't actually get held down by it, but it fuels you going to the next stage. So when we step back and we think about that, you know, how did it all start, right? You've gone through a lot of amazing things that you've done. So where did your journey start when it came into being able to realize that? I'd say to, for me, my contact center journey probably started like 99.5% of the entire industry. It didn't, find, it did, you know, I didn't go seek it. You know, it found me. And I was in retail uh, I graduated from university and I double majored in finance and real estate. And my goal, my dream was to be an investment banker. But when I graduated, it was in the middle of a recession. There were, there were no investment banking jobs. And I worked retail while I was at going to school and I just stayed in that path. There are some uh, companies that thrive, you know, during a recession. And I got a job with one of those, um, a company called AutoZone that sells aftermarket auto parts they do well in that type of environment. Uh, when you start thinking about buying cars, people don't buy them when, when there's a recession, they repair them. And so that, that company was going through some, you know, significant growth. And I got a job in their real estate department, but just got married, moved to a new town. Um, that, that, and I was gone all the time. That didn't work very well. And so for me, I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. I was gone every single week. 
Wow. And I said, well, you know, you can go back in the stores. And I'm like, well, been there, done that. And they said, well, we, we just opened up this thing called a call center. I'm like, oh, what's that? <laughs> and it just started from there. I mean, it went to the point where I eventually became responsible for the operations of you know, two contact center locations, uh, over 800 agents. And I've, I've been in the industry essentially ever since. I, I strayed a little bit, like you mentioned. Uh, but then I realized, hey, this is where I need to be. And I will have to argue with you when you say something about it's not a dream job. It is. It's just taken me most of my life to figure it out. So what's interesting is I, I'm glad you push back on that because I never get pushback. But when I think about it, I say, you know, when I say it's not a dream job, I think there's a lot of people that absolutely do in the moment when they found the job, when they are finally, they hit that part of their life where that part goes, you know what? I love what I do. That I think is not uncommon whatsoever. But when they grow up, is this the part where they sit there and they're thinking about being a doctor or an astronaut or, you know, running a business? Is the call center world the first thing that comes to mind? And I think a lot of times it's probably not for most people. And I think you, you said it best. You, it didn't, you didn't find it. It kind of found you. And it's one of those industries and those places where once you find it or it's found you, then that's where you can really dive in and go, you know, this is actually being able to do great work, right? And that mid-level position is something that you, you remember absolutely loving about it, or do you remember a specific job that just in the past kind of helped you where you are today? So for me, when I started thinking about that role, it, and the, where I find, and I still do find joy and a, and a lot of fulfillment, which, you know, goes into the whole dream job uh, decision uh, and feeling for me is, you know, developing other people and their performance. And, and being in that role, to me, is such a critical role. And I, you know, I also see that kind of translate just being in the contact center. Now, granted, there's all kinds of different types of contact centers. But for me, I primarily have been in, you know, inbound, you know, customer service and sales. And, and when you start talking about having the passion to help people, that's to, to me, that's the thing that has connected me throughout my life. Uh, having the opportunity to develop the skills and, and performance of people brings me joy. I mean, even today, I'm a middle school baseball coach because I just love developing, you know, people's skills and having them finally, you know, in, in that moment, realize that they have more in them than they realized and then they can actually perform at that level. So for me, that, that middle role and that job, that's the place where I found the most passion. Now, when things got in the way of that, that's when I had issues. Got it. And so when you say things got in the way of it, I know there's mentions of toxic culture or things that when it comes to uh, not allowing or giving people the opportunity to have uh, a position in life where they're able to excel or get to the next level, um, do you see yourself or do you see moments in time where there was just unpleasant experiences? There was things that really gave a bad taste in your mouth about the industry or at least pieces within an organization that made you go, this is wrong. It goes back to that same, you know, and it's taken me a lifetime. This, is, this has to get fixed. It's taken me a lifetime to figure it out. But uh, when I couldn't work on helping people to perform better and I had so many things on my plate. Um, and we were, you know, really talking and focusing in on efficiency, 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 you know, and, and getting faster, you know, at what we were doing. And I, and I was just overladen with tasks to do and couldn't develop. That's when things fell apart for me. I, I had a lot of frustration because what happens in those, in that situation, if you don't have a culture and environment that is focused on continuous learning, uh, is you have a lot of errors. You know, I mean, your whole quality program is dealing with nothing but errors. And then if you're only focusing in on errors, then you start having a whole exception processing problem because people start complaining. And it's just a downward spiral. So it, you have to continually focus in on developing the skills of your people. Uh, and that will help galvanize some of those other issues that could actually bring your environment down. That's great. And I think that's so true. I think you, when you just focus on the problems and you don't allow yourself to look at the bigger picture and understand where there are areas of improvement, 
um, it really can put you down a rabbit hole and not really allow you to see what's right in front of your face. But, right. you know, so think about that from an industry perspective. So for decades, we've had a turnover in morale and burnout problem for decades. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we're, we're going back. I mean, contact centers were first really created um, in, in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, because after World War II, we had all this communication infrastructure that was left behind after World War II. And so that's where we, we started contact centers and it's grown from there. So ever since those contact centers were started after World War II, um, we, we've had issues with turnover and burnout and morale. And, and where, where does Gallup, who studies all of these workplace cultures, say that the reason is? Because they found in 80 years of research, one reason, and it has to do with the manager. 80% of the reason why people leave or why they're dissatisfied is because of the relationship they have with their immediate supervisor. Yet when you start looking at how we develop our frontline leaders in the contact center, it typically goes something like this. Hey, you're a great agent. You know, tomorrow you're going to be responsible for the performance of these 15 people. Just show them what you do and you'll be great. Those skills of being a great agent do not translate into being a great frontline supervisor, being a great leader. You may be able to manage things, but you have to lead. You have to do both. And there are six core competencies that are required in order for you to be successful. But unfortunately, we continue to repeat this stupidity. It's insane. You're a great agent. You're going to be a great supervisor. No, you're not doesn't translate. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because it's true almost in any position, right? Just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're going to be good at teaching it, right? Not every player becomes the coach. And um, it's really important that you nail that on the head because there are so many times that just because someone's been in a position for a certain period of time or they performed at a certain level, there's this automatic consideration that somehow they're able to actually get other people not only to do it and learn it but to be inspired to do it you've potentially gotten a lot from your podcast so let's kind of shift to your podcast seeing that uh, you have fast leader it's a great podcast you have like 270 ish um, uh, episodes of course we're only on number five uh, but you had to have learned stuff over this time right and you've had to have been exposed to that so has it gotten easier over time? Give me some insight into, you know, understanding all this time. Well, to find easier. Um, <laughs> so I can say what's gotten, what, what has been easier for me is because of being around for such a long time. And when you start talking about podcasts, typically what happens is, um, well, say of all the population of people that start podcasts is, you know, like 90% of them drop out after 10 episodes. I mean, they start and they don't, they don't continue. And then of the ones that are left remaining, they, a huge chunk of them drop out after 50 episodes. So to, to have as many as I have, it just means that I'm hard headed. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to say no. No, but part of it goes back to that whole learning piece. It's learn or die. I don't, I don't care. And I think this whole, and in, in part of you know, where we are right now in this whole COVID thing, a lot of people, unfortunately, have been forced into learning because they weren't doing it all along the way. And now some of them, and, and no, 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 no not, not using any trick on words or anything like that, they're dying, meaning that they, they can't function in their new role that is now remote or now their team is remote or whatever the case may be. And that's a problem. So when you start you know, thinking about everything that I've learned with this podcast and, and what's become easier. First of all, I don't have to go and try to get you know, guests as much as I used to because a lot, of, a lot of PR companies are pitching their clients to be on my show. So that's been a huge relief. Also, some of these people who I am now getting the opportunity to interview are some of the uh, elite you know, leaders in our world. So like today, there was, as we're recording this one, I'm releasing an episode that I recorded with Doug Conant, who's like one of the top 10 leadership minds in the world. Um, former CEO of Campbell Soup. I mean, it's just an incredible person. And uh, I, you know, and uh, without this podcast, I would have never had audience or the opportunity to learn from Doug Conant in this way. And so now we have, you know, a kind of a personal connection and relationship. I mean, that's fantastic. And so I take all of those learnings and I pull them back into my own virtual leadership academy. Um, so for so for me, when when I start talking about what's come easier, 
Um, it's that I can also pull things out from a situational perspective that I couldn't before because I didn't have the well to draw from. So when you start talking about leadership, a lot of it is just that situational. So what happens in this situation? How should I respond? How should I behave? What should I do? Um, I start a new job. I, you know, even, or I start a new job and the place really needs a lot of fixing up. You know, I, you know, I'm trying to convey and communicate, you know, so that my team connects and has a better vision and connection with me. Cause remember 80% of the reason why people leave is cause why that immediate relationship with the, that immediate boss, you know, it's, it's all these things become so important for, for me to be able to draw upon. And it's been, like I said, it's been a blessing in so many ways. And I'm, I, for me, I want to get to 1275. Well, that's awesome. And, and I think, you know, for me being in episode five, I've also been blessed with the opportunity to talk to a lot of great leaders and being able to understand places and things that, um, that experience I couldn't have gained otherwise, unless I got it from someone who had already been there. Right. And so there's that, that saying that, you know, smart people learn from their own mistakes, wise people learn from other people's mistakes. And the more that you surround yourself with people that have experienced more than you are better than you in areas that you may not be strong in, or maybe areas that you know that it's better to have somebody else be in that role or position is just something that's been a blessing as well. And so I can just imagine of all the people that you've actually been able to interview and have within your podcast, is there any that stand out ones that just go like, you know what, this, this was just eye opening for me, game changing for me. And again, to me, it's kind of situational, but there's a few that stand out. And one is the one that I'm releasing today with Doug Conant. Uh, and he has a book that is titled uh, The Blueprint, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights. And again, fastleader.net, you can look at, um, listen to Doug Conant, watch Doug Conant as well, because we do it in video. <clears throat> but he has in here a character checklist. Um, and he also has, you know, a couple different checklists that are in his book. And one of the things that he talks about for me, which um, helped open and open my eye. He talks about our intelligence, you know, what we know. He talks about our emotional intelligence, which for me, I, I, I believe a lot about. I became certified as an emotional intelligence practitioner. But he also talks about our functional intelligence. So how well do we know our job? How well do we know our industry? How well do we know our organization? And it's that, it's that functional intelligence that's critically important that will allow you to have greater opportunities within this, within this industry. And so, you know, like you said, the wise person learns from other people's mistakes. The wise person and, and wise adults, you know, listen and learn from other people that are outside of their own organization that are in the industry. Mm -hmm. We learn as adults better in community of one another. So listening to these podcasts and participating in groups and getting different perspectives is so vitally important for us to be able to grow. Because if not, then you only know your own four walls. And if something happens to those, own, those four walls, you're in trouble. You go back to that, I'm now forced into a new situation, and I don't know what to do. So definitely continuing to focus on that is important. Another one that sticks out to me is um, episode 216 by, by Rick Miller, who wrote the book called Be Chief. It's a choice, not a title. You have to make the decision to leave. Uh, you have to have a, uh, a, a very top, and really your top importance is that you want to help other people be successful. You have to be giving. You have to be selfless in that perspective. And if you don't have that char those characteristics, don't even bother trying to be a leader. Don't even bother trying to be a supervisor. Be a support person, right? Uh, and so you have to kind of know yourself. And that's part of what, what Rick talks about in the book. And he talks about finding your core four. And those are the four things from a values perspective that are important to you, like integrity and things like that. And it's being able to self-identify. He said, because until you know your core four, there's, there's nothing for you to stand on. And if you don't know where you stand, you can't make a stand. And he, there's a couple of quotes also that he, said, that he says that, that I have here that I'll share. He said, there's huge power in what you feel once you know what you stand for. And then, like I said, is that once you figure out what you stand for, you can take a stand. Those things are so important for all of us to be able to find our joy. Because if you think about all those times in your life when it's like, you know what, this just doesn't feel right. 
You know, I don't feel like I fit here. It's because there's been some violation in, in your core four and you really just haven't identified it yet. And so, like I had said, is, you know, it took me a lifetime to figure out that, hey, this is my dream job, right? You find your core four faster, you'll find your dream job. Well, that's awesome. And I think there's so much to unpack there. I mean, everything from functional intelligence and knowing your four walls and realizing when those four walls collapse and let's give COVID-19 and the whole coronavirus pandemic right now a reality for a lot of people. Your revenue stream may have gone away. Uh, people are furloughed. Uh, the people who, quote unquote, buy your product aren't buying right now. And so that, that forcing of the change, I think, uh, as much as it is painful, it's needed. Because a lot of people won't make that change until they're forced to do so. And those who can make the change, they're going to see that it's going to do them good over the, the course of their life. They're going to see things and do things that they didn't know they could do and be able to make and create things that are going to be game changing. And it's going to be an exciting time, even as, as hard and as dark as it is for a lot of people. I think that there are going to be things that will come of this from a leadership perspective, especially that people will rise to the occasion, right? And so you also, when you talk about agents migrating to becoming a supervisor, and some just should stay agents, they should never become a supervisor, and, and vice versa, people that are supervisors, you know, should have never been put in that position in the first place, because they were set up for failure. You know, you're the creator of Call Center Coach, Virtual Leadership Academy, it's such a great idea, obviously, being able to get people to be successful and be in a position. But it seems like, from what I'm understanding, is there wasn't a system there that did that well. How did you see that and go, you know what? This is a huge gap. This is missing. Where did you come into play with that? Well, and I think the perspective, this is, you know, and, and kind of giving the framework is really important. So I study... I, I study things about human behavior and I study things about adult learning and I study things about change, why people don't, all of those types of things, because for me as a leader, I need to know those things, right? So there, there are companies out there that analyze the adult learning industry and adult learning goes across all industry segments and sectors. I mean, mm -hmm. public and private, it's adult learning. Adults are everywhere. <laughs> so when you start looking at where does the most success come from when you're referring to adult learning? And let's be clear, we're not talking about technical learning. Hey, how do you, you know, use and create a, a nice LinkedIn profile? No, that's not what I'm talking about. How do you actually use, you know, our chat system? That's not what I'm talking about. How, as a supervisor, how do you keep us out of jail and execute FMLA properly? That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is leadership skills. And that's a journey of learning. You don't go to a four day workshop or take, you know, a, you know, to go through 10, you know, classes or sessions of a video and learn how to become a better leader. That's not the way it works. So the people who study adult learning in leadership development paths uh, have had success with what is called a blended learning environment. Okay. And, and virtual environments and creating a virtual academy is perfect for that. So what we mean by blended learning is that we have some videos, you know, and we have some courses. We also have some, uh, what is called, you know, quick courses, rapid courses. We have challenge courses. Uh, we have some live uh, sessions and it's several different ways. We have a community. All of those things are needed because people do learn in different ways. They need their learning at different times. Talk about the situational piece. I'm in this right now. I am dealing with this right now. Where can I get help? Well, you can go to the academy and you can find help. You can find help from other people. You can find help in a mini course. You can find help in a challenge course. There's, there's a lot of different ways that you can learn. And nobody else in our industry is offering anything like that. Everybody else is, we'll either show up and put everybody in a workshop for four days. Yeah, let's take all of our supervisors offline for four days. That works. Well, now we're in COVID. So then, hey, we'll give you 70 videos. Big deal. I mean, so now all you're doing is just getting information. When you start talking about leadership, it's about learning and practice. In order for you to develop your leadership skills, you have to learn and practice. And part of that learning is all of those things we talked about, which includes, what does the wise man do? You said it. Learns from the experience and lessons of others. And okay. so if you're not in a community where you're gaining that different perspectives, guess what your learning is? It's stifled. 
because more than half of our learning comes from a community like that. Well, that's awesome. And I know that you've mentioned in the past about 80%, I think you said, of leadership development programs fail. Why do you think that is? And do you think you've been able to make that piece of it, the, the part that's successful, uh, because of these changes that have been implemented through this communal learning and other type learning that you have through your leadership academy? Well, so there's two things. Um, you know, people leave because of that relationship with their frontline supervisor, and that research came straight from Gallup. Jim Harder, who is the chief scientist for Gallup, was on my podcast, The Fast Leader Show. And he just came out with a book a little, a little while ago called It's the Manager. And at the very beginning, they say in 80 years of research at the Gallup organization, there's one definitive response and answer to why people are disengaged and why they leave. It's the manager. <laughs> and that's at the very front of the book, and yet they have 250 more pages to substantiate that, that statement. So then the other thing is, what do you, when you start talking about successful leadership programs and why, why you know, pro leadership programs fail or don't have their effectiveness is because they don't take a learning path and a learning journey approach that's blended. They don't. It's they, they, like I said, they throw you in a four-day workshop, and I guess there's some magic wands that are given out, and you know, hey, you're going to be a great leader because you spent your time here. It's not the way it works. I mean, so you're, so you're saying they don't have leadership wands that they're giving out? Darn. <laughs> no leadership wands. I mean, you're going to fall. You're going to skin your knees. You're going to rip your pants. You're going to. You're going to talking about that's the ashes stuff, man. Rising from the ashes. You're going to know. You have to give yourself the opportunity to fall, right? So that means you have to push yourself. You know, but you also have to know that you're going to get up. And how do you get up? You get up a lot easier when you have others to help you, right? It's not sitting there in isolation. So yeah. um, when you start talking about this whole learning and this COVID thing, uh, there was a statistic that I the read said something about um, learning, you know, online learning and all that stuff for people who are of leader, leadership manager type of roles has gone up like 53%. Wow. So, and, you know, that's interesting. But I also have to say, well, what about the reverse? What about those 47% that, 47 that aren't? Are they in cruise control? <laughs> so it, again, learn or die. So those 47% that aren't, they're choosing their path. Yeah. And, you know, you have mentioned in the past, and I think you've used the term cruise control. And do you think those people are stuck in cruise control and do you think that's actually something that um, at all times is bad and you need to get out of? Most definitely. So a lot of times people will say, gosh, the year just flew by. You know, I can't, I can't believe it's already, you know, um, October. I think I just went to a New Year's celebration. Right? And, the, and the reason that is, is because you're not disrupting yourself. You are in cruise control. And for those of you who have ever drived long distances, and you know when you are on that, you know, you know, 200 mile stretch, and you, there's not a whole lot of scenery, not a whole lot of traffic, you'll travel 20 miles and like, gosh, I can't believe that just happened. Right? That's what's happening to your life. So you have a choice. You can either continue to be in cruise control, lose 10 months of the year before you finally realize when it, that it's October. So, it's, you know, I mean, it's, you can do that. You know, or you can choose to disrupt yourself all the time. It's a choice. Do you want to be part of the 53% or the 47? Do you think it's a challenge, though, for people to make that decision on their own? Or do you think having good leadership actually helps you get out of that? Or is even with good leadership, you still have to make that decision yourself. And it doesn't matter who's around you helping you and being a good model for what you should be able to achieve. Uh, the answer to all of that is yes. So what I mean is some people are self-starters. Some people can motivate and kick start themselves and get themselves out of a rut. Um, that's not the majority of people, you know, so therefore you need to reach out and seek and help others you know, and help others and, and, and be part of a community. Uh, that's, that's why it's so important for you to get different perspectives. And so, you, you know, what you do have to do is pick yourself I mean, at least start with that. Pick yourself up. So everybody go, went into shock and panic mode, you know, with all this. And now we're slowly starting to come out of it at, at the time of this recording of this, this whole COVID lockdown thing. You know, but everybody was in like panic, you know, oh my gosh mode. Um, but you have to knock yourself out of that and say, 
all right, guess what? You know, some of this is going to be my permanent new normal. How do I now live in this real world? Because we ain't going back. You know, there was a, um, another study that talked about of the people who, you know, can work at home and people who did work at home and how that volume increased, you know, like four or five times. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what they were saying is that less than half of those are probably going to go back, right? They're going to be remote permanent. So that's a new world for everybody. So just think about the ripple effects of all of that. You know, my boss used to be in the, in the office, you know, now they're not, you know, or my colleagues used to be in the office. Now they're not, I used to be in the office. Now I'm not, how's that changing your world? Well, the fact is your world is going to change in many ways permanently. So what are you going to do? I mean, are you going to sit there and be confused and be worried and have all this insecurity, or are you going to find your core four, find a place to stand and move forward? Totally agree. And I think that right now, for those of us that were forced into this change, being able to hone down instead of why isn't it what it used to be? When are we going to go back to the way it was versus now that it's different, what do we do going forward? You know, you said you battled the, the toxic workplace culture and, you know, were there common signs when you were working or when you're helping people saying, you know what, this is the most common sign that I'm seeing there is toxic workplace culture here. And so what's your opinion on that, especially now when you're looking at coronavirus, is that still just as bad as you thought or is it things getting worse? Are they getting better? You know, it's um, my, my mother-in-law who is in her eighties uh, said uh, something in, in jest, you know, about this COVID virus thing. And she said, she thinks it's God's way of actually getting rid of the old folks. <laughs> um, and, you know, while that is kind of funny and kind of scary for some, um, I think we kind of have to also look at that in this situation as whole. Uh, so, like I said, 53% that are, are, are choosing to learn, uh, to be able to deepen their well and fill it, you know, those folks are going to, you know, be okay. You know, the 47 that aren't, they're not going to be okay. And so that, that, that is, you know, that's a, that's a choice and that's an issue. And so that's going to infect the, affect the workplace. You know, it, you have to think about all the things that are going to have this ripple down effect. We have a lot of pent up demand. I say, Hey, invest in companies that purchase things for newborns. Cause we're going to have a massive baby boom because of all this. Right. Um, there's a, there's a lot, you know, they talked about out, al you know, alcohol consumption going way up during this. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of opportunity that exists, not saying that the alcohol drinking is a good thing. I'm not saying that. Um, but what I'm saying is we have to seek out the opportunities. And, and so may, that may be for some of us, you know, moving and doing something different. You know, some of us are forced to, but, you know, thinking about those opportunities, think about, think about where's the place to go. You had mentioned something about, you know, AI and artificial intelligence and all of that. You know, a lot of people in the contact center industry may think that, gosh, it's going to do away with agents and agents' jobs. This is, you know, a, a problem. And the fact is, is that all of those AI solutions have to be taught by somebody. They don't do, they don't perform well by themselves in isolation. They have to be fed knowledge. So why don't you be that knowledge person that helps to feed it? You know, that, that way you're actually, you know, protecting yourself in regards to your livelihood and your family because you're adapting, you know, going back to Darwinism, what species are the ones that are most successful and thrive the most? It's the ones that adapt. So you have to be part of, you know, that adaptation. Totally understand. And it makes sense to be able to look back and say, as you adapt and as you're able to see these areas that need improvement and change from a leadership, though, in a hierarchy where the leadership sometimes gets a filtered view of what's happening in the trenches, right? What's happening in the actual room where your team is really the extension of your business with your consumer or where you're trying to have these touch points with your business. Um, how do you actually get any, any insight or things that you could say, how do you get the leadership to know when these things that need to get changed, where you need to adapt have to occur? Uh, so there's this gap that, that exists between middle management or upper management versus the leadership. Yeah, I refer to what you're talking about as a disconnection between the head and the feet. Okay, so we have the head of the organization, the top of the organization, who's setting strategy and all of these, you know, visionary type of things. But then when it filters all the way down, the feet, the front line, isn't connected with that. And there, cause there's a lot of mixed messages that occur as that waterfall, you know, starts to flow. 
And so we may have people at the very top of the organization when, when they say and talk about customer experience, it isn't what's being delivered on the front line. And so what's important is really that front line learns how to communicate up. So those, those agents, those supervisors, those, those managers, those directors, those VPs, whatever your hierarchy is, but they have to be able to speak the language of the people at the top. So if you're always talking about your contact center in regards to efficiency-based metrics, guess what you are? You're a machine. You know, you're not a deliverer of the experience. Also, when you start talking about the stories that are told in the contact center, those stories that are told about the contact center need to be the stories from the customer, right? So if you are asked, for example, you know, how's things going down in the call center when you're in that elevator ride or you're on that call and, you, you know, sitting there and replying to that and saying, well, our abandon rate was down today, you know, or we did a good job with, you know, our schedule adherence, you're shooting yourself in the foot. What you need to be doing is communicating stories of the customer, right? So if that question is asked, you need to be at the ready and say, oh, well, we had this one customer where I had this problem and this is what happened. This is how we either fixed it or how we have this chronic problem we cannot correct. You know, we have a systematic problem or you know, systemic problem. Those are the conversations that you should have about your contact to your, to your people who are at the top of the organization, not the things about your metrics. Well, it's, it's, it's really good to hear that because we, you know, everyone says, you know, you, you can't manage what you can't measure, you know, and if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And when you think about that, you go back to the outcomes, right? What are the outcomes that a business wants, especially within a call center? Yes, there are financial aspects or business aspects of running the call center, but ultimately if you're talking about your interactions with your customers, there's everything from how difficult and how much effort it takes for them to interact with your brand and business. There's how many things they can do without needing you. And then when they get to you, are they getting to the right person at the right time? Are they able to actually get the things they want without having to constantly repeat themselves or the amount of friction points that they have in trying to get to somebody? And so there's that balance between the cost and the services that you provide and whether or not the customer is actually getting what they need when they need it, how they need it. And I think now more than ever with being able to communicate through SMS, through web chat, through email, social media, video in many instances, um, you're now putting yourself in a position to communicate with customers where they want to be communicated with. But how do you go about doing all that, especially today in a world where uh, teams are remote? Maybe it was easy for them to change. Maybe it was difficult. They're still in that transition, right? And so when you think of almost everyone being remote now, or at least those who are not in essential workers, which I know in many cases you said they're heroes as well, um, those in particular um, heroes that are out there in these jobs that are doing essential work, uh, how do managers and supervisors work through a period like this, being able to balance the essential work of the people that are heroes and separately those right now that they're looking at purely, I just need to make sure my metrics are good. I just need to make sure these numbers are hit. And they're really not looking at the bigger picture of, you know, I'll tell you right now, I've talked to a lot of leaders that have said today, now, more than ever, they've had really, really good experiences of companies they've had to interact with. And some that have been really bad and have never been like that before, which is interesting to see the difference that happens during this period of time. Yeah. Um, to me, and it really depends, this is going back to some of that culture stuff, right? Uh, and talking about the core four. So when you start talking about the core four of the organization, do they align with your core four? And we talked about that. Uh, so if I talk about the four core, four core elements of the organization, you know, it's being able to deliver upon those. And so like, for example, you know, you talk about the Walmart, you know, are you going to go to Walmart, you know, and expect some type of high end, you know, boutique retail uh, experience? I hope not. You know, they're not going to deliver upon those. Right. So does your company have a very clear identity? And so if your company has a very clear identity, you know, this is the opportunity to really just focus on delivering upon that. And then the metrics are going to be where they're going to be. Now, however, 
if you are, are in an organization that is just focused on the metrics, and especially at this time, if you can't focus in on the customer as a human being instead of a widget, you know, or your people as a human being, you know, instead of an object, that's going to be a problem. And so I would dare to say that for many people in the contact center industry, that's where you start having the violation in your core four. You know, I couldn't stand that. When I was in an environment that was heavy metrics based and, you know, hey, just give me a, a as they would say, a hiney in the seat, you know, um, I, you know, so what, we're turning over, just hire more. Um, we'll find, we'll find better ones. I didn't work well in that environment. Because do you think they're focused in on learning and development and wanting to people, people to be successful? Absolutely not. Um, so you have to start thinking even about yourself. Am I aligned? Am I in the right fit? You know, so here's your opportunity to say, okay, well, I have to do this now for a little while. But, you know, once, once things break, I need to invest in myself. Don't wait for the company to do it for you uh, so that you have more opportunities to go and find that right fit. Well, that's really interesting to look at it from empowering yourself as an individual and just saying, you know what, no one's going to do it for me. I have to do it myself. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good leaders out there. There's a lot of people that will take you in, under their mentorship, but that's not the case for everybody. And if you're going to wait for that to happen, um, like you said, you may be in cruise control and time's going to fly by and you're going to realize that um, you never moved up. You never moved into a position and that also creates a sense of toxicity because you have this sense of resentment, the sense of frustration, anger. And look, it's interesting to me in the contact center space that sometimes those that perform the best end up getting pushed the furthest away from the customer. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that really are good at talking to you, it seems like you have to get an escalation. You have to get an escalation. You have to get an escalation in some interactions. And what that leaves is the people that are the ones that probably need the most help or are not getting the help or don't want the help. Um, or all of the above, they're the ones that talk to your customers first many times, unless you have a way to route and manage based on performance or um, being able to do things that are more sophisticated um, in your inbound routing. But generally speaking, I think the system can empower the agents to be able to make decisions and or the supervisors to empower their teams to be able to do what's right. A lot of times it's just you've been here long enough, you move up, you move out. And you get further and further away from the people that I think really could benefit from your discussion with them. And it's kind of sexy and it's interesting that you make calls, you eventually realize the ones that are much better um, in some companies are the ones that you have to escalate to. And that kind of friction is not ideal, right? No one wants to have to escalate to just get what they, you should have been able to get from the first moment and first touch point, right? So I think leadership there is really important. I think you said it well. So when we talk about, you know, you, Jim, and you look at what's going on now with um, the human side of, of things, we've talked a little bit briefly in the beginning about emotional intelligence. And I know that that's important to you. For those who don't know what it is, can you give a brief description? What is emotional intelligence and you know, how has that improved what you're doing today and every day going forward? So there's uh, so for me, I was certified um, by a company called MHS out of Canada that has the largest body of research on emotional intelligence in the world. And for me, that empirical evidence, that you know, scientific-based evidence, uh, is important. So that's why I chose to go down there and go to be certified through their system. You know, and so they talk about you know specific behaviors and attributes, but essentially emotional intelligence. And you'll see a lot of different definitions and. Um, you know, variations of it that it's out there. But, you know, it's, re it's really how you see yourself and how yourself is seen and then how you impact uh, other people, you know, from an emotional perspective. So it's like, what, what do I perceive about this person? You know, how do they make me feel? How, I mean, all of those things that we know are the differentiating factors that are quite tangible. So people will call them soft skills. Mm -hmm. They actually are very hard and measurable. So you say, well, how is that possible? Well, guess what? If I'm one of those supervisors that's churning and burning people, I got an emotional intelligence problem. <laughs> that's a hard metric. Uh, and I've seen it happen over and again. When we look at performance of teams, um, just in the work that they're doing, you know, where are the high performers, right? So then now do I find a combination of high performance and high engagement? So those people are gonna be stronger in emotional intelligence. And, and it's a, they are hard metrics. So I worked for a research uh, firm that measured the customer experience for 15 years. And one of the things that I always used to say is that metrics have no heart, right? You have to give them heart mm -hmm. meaning. And the thing is, 
if you are saying something is a soft skill um, or you're saying it can't be measured, it's only because you don't know how. That's the problem. Everything can be measured. Everything has some type of relationship, either you know, inverse or otherwise. Um, you have independent and de dependent variables. I'm trying to drive performance in something. Well, what are the things that are actually impacting that and their level of importance? Some things are more important to driving that metric that I want to move. Some are less. So if I have one thing, for example, that I need to focus in on to drive that target metric, what is it? Because this whole multitasking myth is just a bunch of BS. You know, you can't do five things at one time. You can't focus on five metrics at one time. You got one shot. You know, what's your best? And then therefore, you can start putting plans together associated with that. But the whole emotional intelligence piece and what's going to drive performance faster, what's going to allow you to be more successful, um, you know, it, th that's the critical factor. I mean, it was talking about MHS and the studies, people who are higher emotional intelligence make more money. The Nobel laureates, the people who've won the Nobel Prize, it's been proven that they weren't the smartest in their field. Well, you say, well, that's crazy. How's that possible? It's because those people were higher in emotional intelligence. They knew how to collect and collaborate, be humble, take risks and make mistakes. All of those things that we know when we think about people who are the most admired by us personally that we know, they're gonna be higher in emotional intelligence. It's not the ones that are socially and emotionally dysfunctional. That's, you know, that's not the way that it works. So I think there's really an opportunity for all of us to improve our emotional intelligence skills and MHS proves that. Up until we get into our 80s, we can continue to improve our emotional intelligence. Our focus right now, especially with the COVID thing, is to you know, really, really improve our skills at being the best you know, contact center professional because it is a dream job. The fact is you have the opportunity to make that dream a reality. And really going back and utilizing some of the things that we've talked about here can help you down that path. Well, I think you could have a whole, a whole session on emotional intelligence, prove it, how you know, um, you know, if it's something that you have innately you're born with or if it's something that could be taught. So um, I definitely would love to be able to have a conversation right at that in the future. But I mean, right now, professionally for you, how have you actually handled the crisis right. yourself? I would, I mean, for me, I would dare to say it's, you know, not been a big issue. And you're like, what, what, what do you mean? I've been working remote for t almost 20 years. And so for me to be told that I can't go to work, it's like, well, then it means, does it mean I don't go upstairs to my office? <laughs> so I, so it, it was no big deal. Uh, it was a bigger issue and transition for the people that were around me. You know, my kids having to go and do, um, you know, online learning. You know, my wife, you know, having to now, you know, work at home. I mean, they had the bigger, bigger transition. So for me, I just had to be more aware of how difficult this transition has been for them. So for me, that's been the big hiccup. Otherwise, it hasn't been a big, uh, a really big issue. The other thing that's been somewhat of a change for me is I regularly go to a lot of the face-to-face uh, -face industry events. Well, needless to say, those aren't happening right now. Yep. Um, so I get the opportunity to network and gain perspectives and learn. Um, and get in community, all of those things where I can now bring it back uh, to share, uh, as well as, you know, advance my own understanding and knowledge and perspectives. So um, that I miss. Uh, hopefully that'll get um, you know, picked back up here shortly in the next month or two. What advice do you have or things that you're doing that can both help people with health, physical health, uh, to be able to isolate yourself um, or separate yourself from uh, either only working uh, or not being able to detach from the fact that your family or significant others in your home at all times. Uh, so, you know, somebody said I have a lot of hobbies. Um, <laughs> I'm meaning me specifically, but they did. Uh, so for me, I, I was like, oh yeah, I can kind of see that. So, I mean, I love to cook, you know, so I spending time in the kitchen and I picked up baking, you know, again, that I had, hadn't done forever. You Banana know, bread? Uh, <laughs> I hear it's the big thing. <laughs> uh, I haven't done that yet, uh, but we've done, you know, some shortcakes and some, you know, some things that uh, for me, I haven't, I haven't really explored into. So that's been fun. Uh, and also I, 
you know, I exercise on a regular basis. I mean, to me, that's vitally important to your mental health. And, and I think, unfortunately, we, we don't do enough of that. I mean, and so for me, uh, I would probably say the past eight years, um, at least five times a week, I do some form of either weightlifting, running, you know, something to, in order to be able to keep myself, you know, physically fit. Because what I find is the whole mental stress uh, and, and th ability to think, you know, I can do that at those times that I otherwise can't. Um, also garden. I mean, I, we're, I love to garden. That, that's something that also is very calming and very therapeutic. You have to get outside. You know, you have to get your, your heart pumping. Uh, you have to then also release your mind, you know, and focus in on other things that are not work or family related because both those can be big stressors. Really started this week into to garden, and so <laughs> for me, um, as much work as it was, and I realized I wasn't good at it. Don't have a green thumb by any means. It was very therapeutic to get out. So I mean, Jim, uh, this has been awesome. Um, it's been great having you. It was great talking to you. Uh, you know, I just want to get a little recap real quick. Where can people find you? Where they where can they connect with you? So the fastest way is to just go to LinkedIn, Jim Rimbach. I mean, there's not many Rimbox in the world, so hopefully you'll be able to find me quickly. And then, of course, the Fast Leader Show podcast is on all of the podcast platforms. Uh, and then CX Global Media is where we're starting to consolidate and put uh, really all of our content. And so that, that is a growing, growing site. And then we have also partners that are contributing to that as well. That is awesome. Very good. So um, everyone, you can reach Jim uh, through his LinkedIn. Obviously, when it comes to his podcast, if you, you haven't started, you got to start now. There's great content there as well. Yeah, and definitely we want all of your contact center supervisors and emerging supervisors to be part of the Call Center Coach Academy. Have to do that. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. This podcast has been hosted by me, Christian Montez, produced, written, and edited by Bogdan Minutes and Joanne Sabo, with co-executive producers Steve Biederman, Lauren Chasson, Christian Montez, Joanne Sabo, and Bogdan Minutes.